Hello, welcome back. I hope you had a delicious lunch and uh, people are still gathering here. But uh, let's keep our agenda busy. And uh, I would like to continue with uh, my old friend uh, from Bureau of European Design Associations and President of Design Austria, a uh, wonderful expert of information design and founder of uh, Hype.at agency in Austria. And uh, Martin Forstleitner will give you a presentation about circular design, simple, what you might learn from John Maeda. So how we may start applying circular design thinking in daily life. The floor is yours, Martin. Thank you very much. Um, good afternoon. Uh, welcome back after lunchtime. And um, just to enjoy this Koya Klein. Khan is not uh, ready for now, but it would be great to have Martin's presentation. Or you didn't do one. Did I? Oh, really? <laughs> you know, my dementia is so <laughs> heavy. I have no idea anymore. No, no, but I think... Klein sounds nice as a name. But Khan is always like having what to say, so... Uh, it's not a problem to talk for him even now, probably. No, it's okay. Just uh, technical. You always have what to say. Yes, shall we talk different topics? Sounds, sounds nice. <laughs> Would you like to say about your agency or something? No. <laughs> Too long. Um, so, warm welcome. Um, Kuhn is coming in some seconds later. Um, I would like to pick up uh, some thoughts of this morning. And of course, we had this uh, circular design and sustainability issue and um, many other things and about heritage and about museums and about design history. And um, for this, I would like to... Uh, in the case of sustainability, it's not too bad, not always to invent something new, but going back to what we have already. And there's one guy, and he's John Maeda. And he wrote this fantastic book of the laws of simplicity. And because I enjoy so much not to sit in my living room and meeting you online, but being here, may I kindly ask you for ah, easygoing interaction. And the first question to you might be, uh, are you familiar with John Maeda? And if yes, to keep in the rules of GDPR, you don't need to raise your hand, just make mmm. Okay, are you familiar with John Maeda? Not too bad, okay. So, for those you know already, John Maeda, there won't be nothing new. For those who are not familiar yet with John Maeda, maybe it is a little help uh, for the future for you. Um, John Maeda, this nice guy, and um, you know, this is one of the books which uh, helps the Pareto Principle. Uh, with this book, you manage 80% of your work because it's so easy going, so stable, rude, simple rules. And uh, we will just test them whether they are still applicable for circular design. And um, for this, and <coughs> as we did this endless talks about how you define design, uh, we have one million ways of how we define design, and we have two million ways how we define sustainability and circular design. So this is only one out of 10 million ways to see circular design, but we have some materials, we have uh, a manufacturing plant, um, and in best case, we have a user, and this user, in the very best case, as our grandparents did, we repair a lot. And even if it's out of its primary use, we find another solution to use it as for planting outside in the garden, maybe for the kids, maybe as a storage. And all the things we collect because ah, there will be some time we could use it and it will be good to have it. So this is a best case scenario. The other way in circular design might be that we recycle the material, which is a nice intention, but ah, a sloppy way of a real circular design. But if we find a way to 
bring it back not only as a material but also as a product in the case of refurbishing or something like this or refilling the glass bottle uh, and then it's already a higher level of uh, sustainability and meeting circular design issues uh, almost in heaven we are if we are able to <gasps> upcycle and make of these transport pallets ugly or even nice furnitures to sit maybe for a longer time or shorter time or if we find uh, if we have some friends or some other neighborhoods and we share what we have and we come up with a longer uh, usage of what we have so if we see this as an ecosystem it's quite a nice and good approach uh, for a circular design in fact uh, for all the designers uh, this is this uh, principle to see it from the future of course we plan and act into the future but it is a good help if we see our issue and if you see our project out of the future to the back and in a circular design if we have a thought on what happening at the very end of a life cycle it helps us in planning and for this it's of course uh, the starting point is uh, the designer when we have all these in considerations what will be in case and in reality after the usage and really have a view on the whole life cycle then we are very close for a circular design planning so that just as an assumption and what we see about circularity um, and these are the 10 fantastic laws of uh, mr john maeda and what we now will do is uh, we will do it one by one and uh, i have a very trustful famous assistant and um, but as ex-president of beta you can trust him definitely what we will do is we will talk about uh, these um, 10 laws and i would like to ask you for your feedback whether you think well this law does it help for circular design if it's a little bit you make mm. if you think oh that's really a good point you say mm. And we measure uh, the decibel and the noise you make. And at the very end, we might have a winner or not, but we will see. Okay? Easy rules, simple enough. Yeah? The only one thing you have to do is hmm or hmm. Yeah? Depends on you. Okay. First rule you measure. Good. And you watch carefully. You're the supervisor. Any more supervisors needed? Is one supervisor enough in Lithuania? It's enough. Okay. Okay. <laughs> oh, good to know. <laughs> so, uh, what looks like uh, Chinese translation should mean uh, law number one, reduce. Um, PowerPoint. Please switch to Acrobat. Um, the simplest way to achieve simplicity is through thoughtful reduction. That's the easiest thing. Uh, the less we have, the less we have for waste and the less we have to bring into circularity. So, um, and this is the example, of course, and you will somehow feel my passion for Japan and Japanese design. These are delivery trucks in Tokyo. Um, somehow, I, I can't imagine that these few people in Japan have less stuff than we have, but somehow even the trucks in the city are quite smaller than in Europe. So if we, whatever we can skip and reduce and making smaller is already the very, very first way to uh, come to a circular uh, community because less stuff, less waste, less to manage. So first test please go for a mm, if you think reducing all the things we need and we have and we do might be a good choice okay <laughs> it was not enough he means <laughs> it was not loud enough <laughs> once again please that's a linear growth huh? <laughs> no short time 
So this was rule number one, reduce, skip, make it smaller. Next one, um, online shopping uh, gives you a fantastic feeling, but also a fantastic management of your order processing. And I only can say uh, like Uniqlo or Uniqlo or however you spell it, um, it's fantastic how they managed the return policy, how quick you can get it. And I think the last 18 months in pandemic times, it has shown that we developed all our manageable skills, capacities, organizations, procedures, how we can bring the good we sold back again to uh, the manufacturing. So this means if we can do it in the return policy, we also can do it in the return policy after the usage. So this is second law of uh, Mr. John Maeda. Organization makes a system of many appear fewer, and if it's fewer, it's simpler. As simple as it is, the smoother it is, the more people will do it. So we need a lot of organization, easygoing organization to join to return our used products, materials, back to the origin place. And the second, Mm, if you agree or not. Okay, thank you very much. Number three. This should mean uh, law number three, time. Savings in time feel like simplicity. And the bad thing about capitalism and our globalization in uh, distribution and shopping is that it takes five minutes to buy a new one and it takes five months to get it repaired. Um, if our service policy is not quicker than our shopping policies, if our service procedures are so complicated that it takes so many times longer than it takes shopping a new one, and we don't know whether it's cheaper or not at this point, as long as we have these circumstances, it will be very, very difficult to uh, come into a more sustainable service-orientated circular economy. And again, if you agree or not, thank you. Number four, law number four, learning. Whatever we learn in our habits, whatever we learn in education, like prostitution twice a day, three times a day, or whatever, uh, greet, say thank you, say please. If we learn it as a standard, and here you see the Japanese guests at the World Championships tidying up their places in the stadium by their own, because Japanese culture never leaves any waste anywhere else and take all of them at home. If we can come into an educational system, into a habit, into a culture of not leaving my mass sink and my waste, my rubbish things out for the community, but taking it home, that it will be a big step in a circular community. Oh. Next, law number five, differences. Uh, don't feel the pressure. This is uh, Niki Saifal in the Herrenhäuser Garden in Hanover, Germany. A beautiful installation in a wonderful spring environment. And um, simplicity and complexity need each other. It's not religion. It's not a dogma. There are things for eternity. There are things to keep. There are things to be out. And we don't have to necessarily have to think about, ah, is it circular or not, these arts? Because it's art. There's an agreement that it could stay longer. So, yes, circular economy, bringing back on the one thing, but not 100%. There are some good reasons that other things are not obliged to do that. Number six, uh, Chinese again. Fantastic Chinese, getting better and better. Law number six, uh, and it uh, should mean context. This is a nice testing whether the presenter knows his slides. You know, that's... 
what lies in the periphery of simplicity is definitely not peripheral. Um, this is uh, in our beautiful Italy, but this is the way how they collect your used materials. This is not fun. This is not a shopping feeling. As long as the context of our systems after don't have the same atmosphere, ambience, tonality, style as we do before, as long as it won't be very sexy to go for a circular community and society. We have to have a big impact in design on designing not only the selling, but also the keeping and the wasting. And for this, law number six, context. Number seven, again, back in beautiful Italy, um, that's a nice invitation to wear your mask. Emotion is everything. We know it from advertising, we know it of uh, seducing, we know it from love, we know it from whenever we want to get someone else in a special uh, behavior, emotion is everything. If we don't love to do it, if we are not attracted, if we are not appealed to be part of that, it doesn't make fun. And I think one rule in design is, if it doesn't make fun, we don't do it. And um, so, law number seven, emotion. Yeah. Number eight, trust. This is Mr. Uh, Ichi Petz, and Ichi Petz runs a fantastic restaurant in southern part of Austria, in Styria, and he is a passionate cook. And he trusts in good food. He trusts in good ingredients, quality ingredients, and of course in healthy food and what has happened or will happen with the food afterwards. So trust is one of the essential part. We can't control, we can't check anything which is called transparency. Sometimes I'm simply too stupid to do it. Sometimes I'm simply too lazy to do it. We have to have our people we trust and then it's, any system is simpler, smoother, and quicker. Number nine, failure. Uh, sometimes we fail. Sometimes it's a pyramid. Sometimes it's a lab. Sometimes it's able to make it simple or circular, but sometimes we fail. That's okay. It's again very close to the 100%. No, we do our best, we can't do it anytime. That's human and uh, nature will do it anyway. A little bit later, takes a bit longer, maybe we are not alive anymore, maybe the world is not here, but nature will check it. We can rely on that. So failure is allowed and not shame. And the last one, simplicity or circular design is about subtracting the obvious and adding the meaningful. Um, does anyone have some sheep of you? Not yet. Not yet. I was in the same situation as you, like before pandemic, now we have some sheep um, because we, we are planting some vines. Uh, you treat your wine when you know that the sheep will eat afterwards your grass in a totally different way. You don't need to think a lot. If your children are playing on the same playground as the others, then you know what you do that the playground is in a good and healthy condition. So please trust your common sense. What you feel is a good thing, it's okay. What you think ah, could be tricky, any kind of data won't help. It is like it is. So again, do the meaningful and skip the non-meaningful. And that's it. So, these are again <gasps> measuring the sheep. Mm. Yes, there's an extra point for number 10. <laughs> um, for this, I'm, I'm very sorry for this uh, thing like that, but reduce, organize, the, the quicker the better. Uh, whatever we learn, we don't have to keep in our mind. Uh, we are happy 
in design about contrasts and differences. It's about the context, it's about the emotion, it's about the trust. Yes, we are allowed to fail, fail again, fail better, did some Englishmen say, and at the very end, um, the one rule, skip the obvious and uh, do the meaningful. And that's it. So, um, if we have a look back, then you can see how in many steps of the procedure of circular design you can imply and apply uh, this 10. Not as a rule, not as a law, just as a kind of inspiration that what things was invented in 2006, we don't have to re-innovate, relearn, but we can use it and we can apply it in a circular design thinking. So, and the final result is, you're the spokesman, who wins? Equal. 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 Uh, learning, uh, uh, law number four, uh, and the one, so the sheep. The sheep. Yeah, the sheep are winning. So, the, the, the Japanese sports people and the sheep. Um, thanks a lot for this. Um, this, uh, because we are in a touchless society now, we are not allowed to give you any paper anymore. So, that's the reason why there is this little chart as a PDF. And there is I don't know whether it's legal or not, but it's the full English version for free online of the simplicity of laws. And there's a nice brochure of Design Austria as a little guideline for uh, designers. And if you scan this with your mobile phone, we will be happy to send you the link for all these three materials. If it doesn't work, you just come to Odrone or me, and we will exchange our old-fashioned traditional business. Does it work? Yes. Yeah. Digital age is a fantastic period to live. And um, for this, thanks a lot, and um, have a happy afternoon. Achoo. Do we have any questions? Or you already interacted with this mm and meh? Uh, okay, I see one guy. I'll try to deliver the microphone quickly. Yes, thank you, Martin, for this very interesting uh, lecture. And it's maybe not a fair question, but I'm going to ask it anyhow. I've once been told that uh, people can only remember lists that go up to seven. So in view of the context of your talk, which tree would you omit so that we can remember the seven uh, others? Okay. Shall we do it based on the list that we created or? Good one. Uh, I, I suffered about this question three nights. And I asked myself, which one I can I skip? And then I had a closer look on his book and he said, take the first three ones and number 10. So the first one is reduce, organize, and time. And the last one is the sheep. And now we have a winner number five, and you see we still have two places for free, which is learning in the Japanese. So keep these five, and if you have the feeling there could be something more, then read the book. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks for the question. Thank you. Anyone else? Oh, it's really nice how you're standing here like a sheep behind the fence. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much, Martin. Thank you. So we're continuing our conference and uh, the next presenter will join us online. And uh, that's Lani van Rieswijk, designer from Atelier NL from the Netherlands. And uh, there will be a presentation with the topic, Think Global, Dig Local. Do we have a connection? Hello, Lonnie. I think we have some problems with muting. Microphone, please. I would love to share mine, but... Hello. Wonderful, thank you. <laughs> Hello, thank you for inviting me uh, for this beautiful day. Um, so I, I think I uh, immediately start now. Yes, yeah. please. Okay, so There's I'm going to really share my uh, to screen. See. <laughs> I'm going to take you on a journey of um, our projects. So it's uh, all started in, uh, in, um, 
Peru, where we did a project with local people. In the morning, we started uh, walking and um, we went with a donkey to collect uh, clay. And then um, we actually uh, uh, had clay in our hands and it felt like uh, I had seen the clay for the first time because normally in uh, the academy, I'm studying at Design Academy, I studied at the Design Academy in Eindhoven, we would always go to the shop, but this moment it was different and I felt a moment of uh, pure joy when I had this hand in my clay, in my hands. And um, I also discovered that um, the creativity came out of my hands. So, and it was more because it, um, we learned that the, the more you're close to your surrounding, the uh, yeah, the creativity comes up. So when we came back to the Netherlands, we started digging um, clay in our own country, and we actually discovered that the Netherlands has a very beautiful landscape. Uh, it is a clay delta, so there's a lot of clay, which we didn't know uh, because we were not looking at it. Uh, then we became a clay expert and uh, we made a ceramic set where you can see that beautiful colors are revealed from dark brown to yellow. So it was really a nature gift, which we could never imagine when we started the project that the soil is so beautiful. Um, we then were invited in a small area in the Netherlands where we worked with farmers. We wanted to explore the whole world, but it was actually really beautiful to just deepen in a small part and the more you dig, the more worlds are actually revealed. We wanted to be there for six weeks, but we ended up two years in, uh, in this beautiful area. We learned from the farmers, we learned that there is a moment for um, seeding, growing and developing and harvesting, but sometimes um, the harvest is not uh, good because of the economics or it, it's uh, it's raining. Uh, we live in a society where we always have to have instant satisfaction, where we can't have failure or where everything has to be makeable. But then we also learn that it's very important to, to grow and develop and then sometimes your harvest is lost, but that it also gives new paths. And this was essential for our work to, to really deepen and to understand uh, the field to talk with the people who have knowledge of their land. Um, we also brought a photographer who made, made amazing pictures, um, putting the farmers in their fields. And um, you can see that they're all very proud. It was only a five minute uh, uh, job. So they didn't have more time. <laughs> what we learned from the farmers, and it was really beautiful, is um, to, to look closer to nature. And when we collected all these bot bottles of, uh, of earth, um, you, you, you can throw them on one pile, but then you, you don't have anything. But if you say, okay, this is from farmer Ben and he's harvesting potatoes, or this is from farmer uh, Carla and she's um, busy with strawberries, all of a sudden each material gets its value. And this is what we're trying to do in our work to really appreciate the, the small. And we made a whole wall um, representing the polder, the area. So each um, tile is a, a plot of a farmer. You could also see that the, the colors are very different, but this is also according to the crops which are growing. So on the left side, it's more sandy areas where more bulbs are growing. And in the middle, there's uh, more for heavy vegetables uh, like sugar beets. So the earth also tells about what's going on, uh, why there's a, a certain factory in, in some areas or anything actually can be related back to Earth. Uh, we also made this machine where you can uh, put in Earth and then make tiles. And then the ceramics directly served from the land, the potato bowl, the bulb face. So you, you can see here six different shapes, but by adding sprouts and handles, it gives identity. So the milk jug becomes a bulb face and a coffee pot and the potatoes are served from the potato soil. When uh, we did this uh, project, um, we invested a lot of time with the farmers, we're talking to them, driving a tractor, housing potatoes, I even saw a calf born. It's all very important to literally go uh, with hands uh, in, in dirt and to really understand. Um, we, we were there for two years, but then in half a year, 
uh, when we presented this project, it went worldwide. And what we wanted to do is actually to thank the farmers who were an essential part in this um, work. So we organized the meal, which we um, did in the fields, and everything actually was brought from the land. Beautiful uh, crops, uh, food, and it was sunny day. And a very a nice compliment from a farmer was, um, he, he, he told us, girls, when you first came to my fields, I thought, you can't make ceramics. Um, I'm harvesting potatoes here. But then later, he told us, when, when my harvest is ruined, we can always harvest ceramics. And this is very beautiful because um, someone who is looking to his field every day all of a sudden gets another perspective. And this is a very beautiful gift how actually creative people can bridge the world from farmers to specialists, scientists, um, and showing them uh, another way of looking to, to that same field. Later, the ceramics uh, came into production because we wanted to also make tableware which you could uh, really use. And we did it with the oldest ceramic factory in the Netherlands, Royal Tegela Makkum. Uh, unfortunately, I had to, to uh, stop with this because uh, crafts uh, are um, yeah, disappearing and they had to stop with all the traditional and contemporary uh, ceramics. Luckily, they invest their knowledge into um, facades of building at the moment. But then we had to um, yeah, go and, and make it ourselves. We learned a lot from them working together and it was very beautiful to see an idea of you in production. And you have to think that this investment for Royal Tegla Markham was not easy because every clay has its own character. So also needs its own um, uh, glazier and the machine needs to be cl clean. So it cannot be a mass production. It's really uh, hand work. So we also work together with chefs, um, earth to table. Um, this is our church. Um, we're very lucky as young designers, we got this uh, opportunity to, to be in this space and to um, make, a, 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 this is where a lot of creative people ask for to, to make a place uh, blooming again. So inviting the neighbors and uh, doing a lot for the area. But what happens a lot is when the creatives um, uh, ha made this happen, investment co uh, companies come and then you have to leave the building and they would earn a lot of money. So when that happened in 2015, when they wanted to kick us out, we didn't want to leave. And we also wanted to make a statement for all the creatives um, to... to uh, yeah, to 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 to, uh, to to stay in the place. And what we did, we organized a huge crowdfunding because we went to the bank and we asked them, like, can we buy this building? But they look only to our, our financial figures and they said, no, of course not. How do you live? They didn't look at the social value of everything which was organized, of the neighbors who, who came in, and uh, um, they only looked at the financial pace, page. So we were out in five minutes. But then we, we talked with, with the neighbors and they were like, you know, if you are kicked out, we are going to throw with uh, tomatoes because we want you to stay. <laughs> and uh, we're like, okay, we don't have any money. What we do have is a lot of earth in our basement. Would you like to help us to make uh, uh, tiles from this, little tiles? And we invited a lot of people and it became like a, um, Charlie in the chocolate factory and people got the same uh, wondering as we had for these beautiful clays and together with the neighbors we made 3,000 tiles in one week and then during the Dutch design week in 2015 um, people could buy it for 35 euros one tile and they could write the name on the wall and yeah, it's really crazy, but we raised like 80,000 euros in, uh, in, in that week. Um, and what I think is beautiful about this story is that the, the, what you can do with a whole community and also to kind of um, show the, 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 the social value of a place. And the bank then uh, gave us a, mo a mortgage to, to stay in this church. Um, we work with earth and we make also uh, paints from it. Um, so the, the, 
there's beautiful full colors which are revealed by earth and um, then we also use that in different projects so we're also using it uh, for the street tiles in Eindhoven there will be a new city pavement and then we do these kind of research searches and um, a color fan uh, which is also directly from the earth for the paint uh, for different houses we do a lot of projects with students we teach at the design academy in Eindhoven and we also learn them the importance of earth and to really work with their hands. I show you a little uh, fragment of a movie. And here when we are building the, the oven all together, it's a clay oven which we made from the surrounding. We believe that uh, the craft of digging is, uh, is very important to, to literally dig, to, to work with your hands in soil and to understand uh, the material. Um, the, the more you dig, the, the more layers are revealed. And what I always think is very beautiful when you draw a circle around you, you can find uh, a lot. We always want to look uh, to a neighbor or we want to go far, but um, uh, everything is, is there. We just have to, to believe in it or to um, appreciate. Um, when we were uh, working with the, the clay, we also discovered that we can make uh, glass from sand. And this was a whole journey which we did where we traveled from the north of the Netherlands. We followed the route of the Romans and we collected sand from uh, beaches, rivers, uh, dunes and quarries. And we took a little sample from each uh, place. We also um, met uh, uh, big uh, glass companies or sand um, excavators and we asked them uh, if they would like to help us to, to make uh, uh, glass from sand. But they said like, well, girls, uh, we think in millions and the perfect glass is already invented. So, mm, sorry. But of course, for us, um, this was uh, very uh, exciting then to try ourselves. So we did a lot of recipes to understand the sense and to make our own glass. Why it's important? Um, it's because uh, the, the white sands which are used for everything are slowly um, getting very scarce. So we are looking at other alternatives where we can use abandoned sands, sands which the industry would say is polluted, uh, which we can turn into glass. At the moment, we have recipes of 700 uh, different uh, types of sands, which we uh, um, translated into glass. And here you can see uh, a visualization of how we found the recipes. So the broken ones is a, is a filled recipe and the foaming ones is where uh, the sand delivered something else. Here you can see uh, a lot of uh, different outcomes of this research. We always um, have the, the, the sand when we go to a place collected in these boxes because it's a visualization actually of, of knowledge uh, where you can talk with a child and explain but even for scientists it's very nice to see the conversation of the places and then to have actually knowledge visible. Uh, in 2016, we uh, made our own glass oven because it wasn't uh, possible to use our 
polluted sands into the the existing ovens, ovens, and we managed to make our own glass from wild sand. That was a very beautiful moment. This is uh, sand with a lot of iron inside, and that's why it's colored dark. And here you can see different colors from different places uh, in the Netherlands. We also um, have some leftover of glass, and this we turned into a, a glass window, which is uh, called the Sand Collectors, which is an image of me and Nadine, Nadine standing in Earth. Now I'm going to show you a, a movie about sand. To move from our lives, everything that depends on sand, and the world would look very different. You would have no glass, no computer chip, have no food. We're just not aware of how important sand is to our daily life. Sand is a massively underestimated resource. You can't build a house or a building without sand. And this sand has to come from somewhere. Unfortunately, we can't use the desert sand of the Sahara or any other desert for construction. You hear people talk about the end of oil, but nobody's talking about the end of sand. Per noi la sabbia è maggiore del loro. The demand for that resource is such that the illegal excavation and commerce in sand is a worldwide problem. Singapore is being accused of expanding its coastline with illegally dredged sand from neighboring states. Of expanding its coastline with illegally dredged sand. Being accused of illegally taking illegal sand mining and becoming an international challenge. You can see this huge trade around the world and um, sand moving from one area to another and it's often ripped up from beaches. It's big. It is big, big. Si you fait l'extraction sauvage, que ce soit dans les rivières, sur les plages ou au large, on va aboutir inexorablement à une disparition des plages. Or, les plages reculent. Et ça, c'est une tendance qui est globale. Quite significant environmental damage and degradation. Some of the islands off the, off the coast of Indonesia have literally vanished. We lost our environment. We lost our livelihood. We lost everything. When we are raising sand, then uh, whatever living communities are there, they will just uh, be eliminated. In our consciousness of the picture postcard of a beach, the idea that, that it might not be there anymore, I don't think it's something that people think about. So, yeah, um, we didn't know about the sand was getting scars and all the things that was going on. Well, we 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 started in Peru where we discovered our own clay and um, then we started to wonder. Um, we went on this journey, then we wondered like, oh, can you make from sand glass? And we realized that sand is a very important material in the world. Without sand, no, no buildings, no computer ships, no glasses. Um, so we we went from one to the other and we had a lot of questions so it was a journey where we as designers didn't know where we were going it was just um confronted uh and and learning more and more from uh from also scientists we work together with michael wellens a lot and he also teach us that there is enough sand in the world but it's the way we use the sand which makes it scarce we wanted to do a project where the same journey as we had, where we actually weren't aware of our environment in, like when we were young and suddenly start to become aware and to, to wonder and to have these questions. So how to bring people in the same wonder and work. So what we did, we understood the, the power of a community with this crowdfunding, which we did with our church. So we ask people to jo join our project and to collect a bottle of sand. For some people, it's holiday sand. 
for other people when they um, take the sand from the beach and they are there with their loved ones. It's a moment of celebration. But then they also start to realize how beautiful the sand is beneath their feet. Then they also wonder, can I actually send this sand to Altianel? Am I not stealing it from the beach? So this is also a discussion we want to raise. It's such a normal thing to do to take a souvenir from holiday. Um, so, but what, what we thought like when we would just scream like there's a sand scarcity, everyone would kind of be like, I don't know what to do. It's the same if you would say like there's space ways and we don't know what to do. Because, but if I say the next morning, like you can't send this as a mess anymore to text, text message to your friend, then it becomes more tangible. So what we want to do in our projects is uh, to give people their own uh, uh, speed of understanding the the beautiful um, uh, environment around around them. So many people uh, send us sent with their story. We were very interested in the story uh, they sent to us. So there are at the moment like uh, about uh, 795 uh, people who join and we we read all these stories and we made categories of these stories of, of what kind of stories been told because it's actually very beautiful that it's stories about loved ones about it's about war it's about the beauty of nature so it's actually about everything what i find very beautiful if you think of grains of sand that they are all traveling and coming from far like uh, brought by by rivers and seas from uh, from deserts and mountains and then they are all there uh, on the beach um, these uh, grains of sand and when I look at these grains of sand I always have the feeling that I have part of the world in my hand and understanding also that we all came from far we all traveled we all have our own wrist history and how can we understand um, our our colors um, so we um, the Categories we had was wet, dry, hot and cold. And I want to read uh, for every category uh, what we wrote. Um, wet, dry and cold. Natural rhythms are often unpredictable and work in extremes. From volcanoes to glaciers, earthquakes to hurricanes, deserts to rainforest, summer to winter. Nature's patterns, nature's patterns exhibit extraordinary variety. The fine balance of every element in nature is fundamental to our survival. Rapid climate change is pushing Earth's delicately balanced system into an increasingly precarious state. The sands in this category have been collected around the world during moments that speak to the intricacies of the system, reminding us that we are not only witnessing, but an integral part of our world. So there are many stories on our website which you can read about this category. Then we have, um, oh, sorry, big, small, fast and slow. What defines the way in which the Earth embodies time from the way that humans perceive it? At what point does the slowness of nature encounter the speed of civilization? A river flows from mountains into the seas, carrying billions of grains of sand chiseled from the rocky surface. Winds, currents and tides transported these to beaches, sculpting the earth throughout the ages. Yet the immediacy of modern life means that nature embodies its, its force and tranquility is often overlooked. The sands displays in this category are representative of moments that encourage us to slow down and appreciate the beauty of being small in a big world. Insiders and outsiders, borders and corridors. Sand is transported by ice, currents, winds and gravity. The landscape is never final. Just like people, sand is always on the move. Yet unlike people, it only ever faces physical barriers to its gathering. One person may move across a border with ease while another may be denied safe passage. From the struggle for land and power to the displacement of people in war and conflict, or the privilege of travel to the intrusion that this movement may impose only on local culture, the sands 
presented in this category reveal stories of place and origin and speak to the complicities of the human experience in an often divided, divided world. New world and old, ancient and modern. Sense reveals the narrative of history by preserving the past, from the ruins of an ancient city to the sheen of modern architecture. From a traditional fishing village to a beachside tourist destination, there is a deep history hidden in the ground beneath our feet. A multitude of the layers exist from prehistory and ancient times to the pre present. As our world changes rapidly from day to day, even yesterday can be perceived as an old world. The sand displays in this category refer to the past as fossils, artifacts, ruins and memory, elements we might learn from as we attempt to build a better future. Mind, matter, body and soul. Just like the earth, the human body is composed of billions of particles of matter. The intrinsic connection between the body and the earth yields moments of profound professional importance intertwined with landscape, backyard memories from childhood, family holidays, destinations where, where one met their love, first love and where lovers said goodbye for the last time. The sands in this category represent the unique profound moments in life that connect us all to friendship, family, success, failure, love, loss, life and death. Resource and extraction, abundance and scarcity. Sand is similarly ambiguous, but it's the second most consumed resource on Earth. It's regularly excavated via mining or dredge from the bottom of the sea, then exported to other countries and locked up in buildings and roads. It's a quickly disappearing from the Earth's surface due to the overconsumption, due to the extraction of natural sand, seasides, lands that once produced a wealth of fruit and fish wither into lifeless trash strewn beaches. The sand presented in this category tell the story of the earth both in its abundance and its scarcity, reminding us that we need to slow down and allow nature to replenish itself. So visit this website to see more of the stories people have collected and handed in. A project we are currently doing is a, a project in South Africa where we worked with abandoned sand to um, uh, use it for, uh, to make a glass. I'm going to show you uh, a little uh, movie. I'm in love with sand. <laughs> we visit uh, to see if we can make glass. So we are actually examining if it's also possible glass from the what they say, polluted sand when there's iron inside or other minerals. Could we turn the, the waste of mine, the waste sand, uh, into glass? And my dream would be it would not be toxic anymore. And that then that we can set up, for example, uh, make a glass in the workplace where people can work. So that the area sits around these mines could make glass. Based on skills transfer for instance with glass, if we transfer skill of manufacturing the glass from sand, yeah. something that an average individual can understand and be able to implement. You know? yes. So it's a possible dream um, looking at all angles, even the angle of where South Africa is at the moment is unemployment, youth unemployment, not just unemployment, you know. Yeah. And um, also looking at um, environmental factors, the fact that um, you know, the fact that, I mean, how sustainable is creating glass from pure white sand, yeah. you know? Um, and you need to find sustainable ways of doing that. Yeah. The most sustainable way at this point would be utilizing waste yeah. to create or produce that glass. So um, we're, we're always uh, researching. And as you can see that uh, these are very beautiful colors which are, are revealed, but for, my, for us the most important is to, to um, answer these questions like how can we build uh, where we, we don't lock up the sand into the buildings, but that we give the sand back to nature. Um, why are we only using white sands to produce the glass all over the world? 
uh, how can we work with our local resources? How can we keep uh, nature in balance? At the moment, we are having an exhibition, uh, 15 years of digging, um, Earth Algamy, 15 years of digging. So where all our work is um, uh, together in uh, one uh, exhibition. So our research, our journeys and uh, what we made. And we hope to um, inspire a lot of uh, people to, um, to, to wonder and to see how beautiful the world is. Um, um, Ines, thank you um, a lot. <laughs> um, I think I have to close the presentation. Um, yes. <laughs> thank you, Lani. It was definitely very attractive aesthetic content. I really adored these boxes with your collections of sand. And I, maybe I'm wrong, but what I saw on the map that you don't have any sand from Lithuania, am I right? <laughs> no, uh, I, I think we don't have. So uh, it would be wonderful if, uh, if someone, if it's uh, allowed actually to send it, but we could also imagine that someone doesn't want to send and that's also good. <laughs> so maybe you can use this conference as a, like, I, I would really personally encourage people uh, to donate Lithuanian sand uh, to these fantastic guys who are working for years and creating this wonderful project. Do we have any questions except uh, maybe something collecting, connected with the sand, digging? Nothing else. Okay, so please all send a piece of sand from your homeland and thank you very much. And I think we can uh, go to the last presentation because we kept impatient our one uh, of the most uh, tend to talk person. Uh, so let me welcome on stage uh, Kuhn Klein, uh, who is an art historian, terrorist, writer, uh, editor in chief of Ons Amsterdam magazine, and uh, also, as I understood, working at Design Co. Uh, Academy Eindhoven, if I'm right, or somehow connected, not anymore. Okay, so the presentation is called The Road Less Traveled By, How to a Cliche Can Actually Get You Killed. Uh, thank you, ladies and gentlemen, good afternoon. Uh, don't run away, this will be short. There'll be a bit of music in it and uh, a dance and uh, a bit of film. And uh, after all these marvelous presentations of today, uh, I'd like to give you an impression of the kind of discussion that went on in Eindhoven. Some of you were there and remember it well. Uh, and my role there was basically to spoil the fun or rather throw things at students that confuse them even further. Uh, so I'd like to talk about a few of those things, basically under the guise of uh, let's talk about cliches or the difference between a cool concept and a cold cliche and the difference is that a cold cliche could actually kill you. Uh, but before I do, I'd like to tell you uh, some of my credentials as a designer, which are nil, because I'm not a designer at all. But through my contacts in Eindhoven, we were able to organize a few summer schools in Lithuania, uh, in Nida, in Panemun, and, and Vilnius. And I'll show you a few pictures of them. Uh, these were combinations of students from Eindhoven of different nations and students from the Lithuanian Academy of Art in their design process. And we did all sorts of fun things. Uh, the trick was, of course, to very quickly, within two weeks, uh, do some research and then create an, uh, a show, uh, an exposition of, of things that we made. And basically, it was, of course, to open the minds of the Lithuanian students who were keen to learn what the hell went on beyond their borders of their land or beyond their uh, uh, country. So we made, for instance, our own uh, artificial amber, but uh, then, of course, with some decent Thai shrimp in it, so that it would look more attractive. Um, what happens when you put MDF in seawater first and then uh, dye it? Or, and then we created a show, for instance, of how you could defend against the evil Russians using the toys that you can buy in any beach store. Uh, and these little exhibitions were well visited and were very, quite, you know, quite popular, I would say. Uh, uh, may, could also be because we always offered free beers as well. And, uh, and they were joy to do, and they were very relaxed, and it was summery, and some people were, so, were so extremely relaxed uh, about them. Um, but uh, this is from Panemune, where there's a, a lovely pond around the castle, and uh, the students created some sort of magical light show underwater, which you then later on 
repeated in a, a, a derelict building in the heart of Vilnius next to the railway station. There it is. Quite grand. And uh, again, uh, eye openers to people who always think that design should be about something. Well, this was really inspired by what, you, what they had met around the village, how memory works in a village like that, etc. And finally, we did the similar project only, uh, of only a week in a restored synagogue right in the center of town. Uh, the interior was still uh, derelict and uh, still under construction, and we tried to imagine what the function of such a house, of such a building, could be later on. Again, just bringing a few students together, and it's through that that I got to know Lithuania a bit, the Lithuanian context a bit, and a lot of Lithuanian people. Uh, and the one thing I did not learn is the Lithuanian language. You'll have to really work on that to, to make it easier. Right. So I'd like to talk to you about a few ideas that went around then and you can imagine that a lot of these uh, Lithuanian students are very keen to learn what this whole notion of a concept was, conceptual design. Uh, it sounds brilliant uh, but it can actually sort of get you down or rather confuse you or actually uh, uh, tie you down you might say. So I'd like to talk about one of them but before I do I'd like to ask you if you know what this is. You don't have to hmm but if anybody knows what this is Cool concept. Does anybody know what this is? I'll show you in detail. No? It's a bucket. Well done. Well done. All right. We'll see, see, see the bucket again. Right. Well, nature prep. Let me talk to you about Beethoven and goats. One thing I don't like about design, a typical thing, is tiny houses. These are all the rage in the Netherlands. You, uh, you want to reduce your footprint, you want to do away with all your stuff, and you buy a tiny house. And I can see from the point of view of a designer, these are wonderful things to build. Because you have to put somebody on 20 square meters, and you do want to bring some of your books and some of your stuff, and uh, these are quite ingenious constructions, and they're expensive too. And the people that live in them, I know one of them who actually bought one, is very proud to say that he's now sort of entered a new life. It's not like he entered a monastery, but it's almost like that, right? This, and, and there's always this kind of moral lesson towards you, like, I'm able to get rid of all my stuff and you know, just live in this small house. Gorgeous things. And the reason they piss me off, really, really piss me off, is because it's not about the tiny houses, uh, but it's about the space around them. Um, this is where this friend of mine lives. Now, um, for a Lithuanian, you might think, what? But the Netherlands, I may remind you, is slightly busier than Lithuania. We're about the same size, same height, by the way, about 300 meters, but there's 2.8 2 Lithuanians and 17 million um, uh, Netherlanders, and they all are cramped in this small space, and they're all obsessed, of course, with organizing public space. They're very good at it, but the idea that you could just put a house somewhere in open space like this is not the way we do things. So there's something very pretentious about it, and this pisses me off, as you can see, because this is not how the rest of the Netherlanders live. This is how the rest of the Netherlanders live. This is considered good urban planning for Netherlands. You get, you know, you get your tiny house, and you get your garden, and you get an approach for your car, and it's all perfectly well organized. You can even see, if you look closely, there are different types of houses in such a well-built up and organized area, so the different income groups can find different levels of housing. Uh, and sometimes some of these districts are even quite attractively organized. You know, there's a circle in the middle. This is Amersfoort. So this is what people have to live, how they have to live in the Netherlands. And it's not even that bad, actually, because, you know, you could also live here if you were Chinese by accident or here. And then, of course, the concept of a small living space becomes quite acute. Uh, these are pictures from Hong Kong of people actually living in tiny houses, four people or one person. And these are the, these are the truly dismal images of what housing crisis can do for you. Uh, you can manage, of course, you can have a bath, and you can have a guitar, and you can play around a bit. Uh, this is Thailand. Uh, and you can even have it run a shop from there. And these are the tiniest ones. These are basically just beds with a bit of space around them. So you can imagine that this pretense of the uh, public housing, of these tiny houses, 
annoys me. The guy under the red arrow is my friend Kai, who actually lives in one of these houses. And I've told him all this, uh, this too. So, but he says, of course, to his benefit or to his credit, the houses are sort of carbon neutral and there is a lot of, they recycle their water, etc. But, but I'm still pissed off. I'm still not pleased with the way this goes. Now, where does this come from? And here, here you touch a little bit on this notion of concept. Of uh, you can you can immediately grasp the concept here. Reduce your your, your footprint, uh, live outdoors, and uh, mind your own business. Basically, where does that come from? I think it comes from here. Uh, end of the end of the 18th century. Let me take you back a bit. I'm an art historian. I, I enjoy these things. Uh, uh, this is the time of the Enlightenment, as you know, especially took hold in France, where people explained to you that the world was a big clock. And if you studied every item of that clock, you could take it apart and reassemble it. These are the people who found out that the air around you consists of different gases. Uh, and that took away a lot of the magic of being in the world. It took, a, took away a lot of your natural experience. So against these Enlightenment tendencies was a response which is usually termed romantic and it's usually associated with Germany. And it has to do very much with going outdoors and taking a walk. And who better to instruct us in this feeling than good old Beethoven. But Beethoven, uh, as you know, wrote a bunch of symphonies. You at least, you know, you can hum two of them, you know, the da 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 from the fifth and uh, I mentioned Werden Brüder from the last, but I wanted to I direct you to the sixth symphony. Music is music, and you shouldn't really infer any meaning, but of the sixth symphony of Beethoven, you can because he did so himself. Um, it was written in a time in Vienna, when Vienna, around 1806, when it was besieged by the French, by, by Napoleon, which was bad in itself, but it also meant that if you lived in the circle of Vienna, you couldn't go out. You couldn't go out in the countryside. And if you've ever been to Vienna in the summer, it can get quite stuffy. It got quite warm. And you can poor Viennese, like Beethoven, really missed their long walks in the countryside. So the Sixth Symphony is very much inspired by this opportunity to go back out and meet the world again. And the first uh, I'll, I'll let you hear a bit. The, the first bit of the symphony is called Erwachen heitere Empfindungen bei der Ankunft auf dem Lande. So the awakening of happy feelings upon arriving in the countryside. Let's see if this works. It works. It's a great heighting. So imagine this, you've been cooped up indoors and it's the first time you can go out again. And what does it tell you? birds. I won't do the whole thing, but here you are. Your, your happy experience is awakening, you know, you're open to nature. It's like, like your lungs are breathing again. And what else will you encounter when you walk through uh, the countryside? Mind you, these are proper walks, right? A guy like Beethoven would go for a walk of 12 hours, not, not to stroll around the park. And the experience would be quite profound, especially if you've just been besieged by Napoleon. What else would you meet? You meet farmers or peasants even. And farmers in those days were a different species of human, right? They lived in close contact with nature. They were good-natured and honest people. They were not corrupted by the big city. And these are people that you would rarely meet in your busy city life, but outdoors you could finally get get to grips with them and taste what life was really like if you lived like that. For instance, they would you would meet them and they would dance. And they would crude dance, but here you go. Okay, so you're out indoors, outdoors, you've, you've, you're, you're, your heart's opening to nature, and you've met honest, hardworking, uh, simple people. But the, the experience of the outdoors can only be complete if you go 
right one-on-one -on -one with nature. It's of the forces of nature itself. And what better force of nature than a storm, a, a night storm? Uh, then you really taste how, the sublimity of nature, of course, how, how, how marvelously big it is. Beethoven saw that too. It starts to rain a bit. I think you got the picture. So this is what you were like. This is what your mindset was in his days. And it's always associated, especially painted with a traveler, a single man walking through uh, a vast environment and experiencing all these gigantic impressions, like, for instance, a tree which is half alive and half dead. And you're facing this all alone. Uh, but it's a pure experience, right? These wanderers with their coats struck by the wind and a guy standing alone. And finally, of course, there's the highest summit at which you can all this experience if you're at the top of the mountain, uh, facing creation, meeting God himself somewhere in the distance. Right? Did you get a picture of what this romantic feeling of nature might be like? And so suppose you live here and you feel a bit like Beethoven and you want to change your life and you want to do something interesting. Suppose you live here. Suppose it's 1780 and you live here in the castle in Versailles. If ever there was a strictly organized world, it's this. You see, Every tree in its right place. Well, suppose you're a happy girl from Austria and you've married the French king. And you have to dress up like this, right? And uh, you don't really feel like that. What you feel like, you would like to go outside. This is what your husband looks like. So you, want to get, you want to entertain yourself. You want to go back into this, something like that. This is a lovely village from Normandy. And it's recreated on the grounds of the Versailles Palace. It's known as the Le Petit Amour de la Reine. The queen built this for herself. And you can see it's a perfect little village. It's got everything. It's got a well and it's got houses and it's, you could uh, wander around there. And Marie Antoinette, the queen I'm talking about, uh, spent a lot of time there. And this is brilliantly recreated in the film that's about, that exists about her. So she takes off her dress and she dresses up like a peasant girl with a big hat and a, a loose dress. And she goes outdoors and she enjoys the world. <laughs> Now, who wouldn't want to live there? And uh, if you think this is uh, slightly ridiculous, and if the Queen of France builds herself a, a beautiful village where she can retire and read Rousseau and, re and, and tell everybody that there is a pure way of doing things, uh, it's not entirely without frills, of course. There's a lovely Belvedere. And of course, this is there too. This is the laitière. This is the place where the goats were milk and the milk was put in buckets. And of course, you need a bucket to do that. And here comes the design question or the design commission. Can anybody design a bucket for a queen? Yes. So here's your bucket designed at the Sèvres Palace. <laughs> um, and again, you laugh because it's entirely frivolous, of course, to build, uh, to make a bucket like this with a gold trim. So there's more of them, actually. There's lots of them. Lots of goats attached to them. But my question is, is there an essential difference between these two things? You may have been extricated in, uh, in, in a kind of concept of uh, uh, saving the world by reducing your footprint. At the same time, you're just living a romantic fantasy, just like Marie Antoinette. Um, I have one more, if you're, if you're up for it. Right? This is about two poets and one poem. And uh, it's a poem by Robert Frost, uh, it's, uh, Two Roads Diverge in the Yellow Wood. A lot of people know this. I'll, I'll run it by you. There's a text here, uh, so you can later on pretend that you knew it all along. But I have to introduce you to the poet himself, Robert Frost, 1874-1963, an American who, uh, somewhere halfway through his life, decided to go back to England to see if he could make it truly in literature, and became quite famous, became the first American, uh, not American poet laureate even. Um, this one you don't probably know. This is his friend, Edward Thomas. is an English writer and critic. 
and a difficult person. Uh, we would call him manic depressive these days, I think. But in those days, you just had to have a wife and kids and see if you can manage throughout. And he wrote critiques a lot, uh, thousands of them, read everything, was very influential, never actually wrote poetry himself, uh, struggled. He's a Welshman, I don't know, happy by nature, but he was particularly sort of struggling with making ends meet and, and getting through life. And the interesting thing is that Robert Frost came to Britain uh, just as World War I was breaking out, difficult time, especially for Thomas. He was 37 at the time, uh, so he was not required to join up, but in uh, social circles, this was always rather awkward. So why are you not at the front, young man? Well, he's 37, he has three kids, I don't have to go. But uh, it burdened Thomas that he wasn't there. But Frost was a great relief. Frost was a, uh, you know, you, you know you're Americans, right? They're plucky and they want to go out and they're strong. And uh, what, what bonded them more than the love of poetry was the love of nature. Um, now see if I can get you that poem first. Oh, can, Guinea Miss, can you start this, please? Oh, is he still there? Two roads diverged in a yellow wood And sorry I could not travel both and be one traveler Long I stood and looked down one as far as I could To where it bent in the undergrowth Then took the other as just as fair And having perhaps the better claim Because it was grassy and wanted wear Though as for that, the passing there had worn them really about the same, and both that morning equally lay in leaves no step had trodden black. Oh, I kept the first for another day, yet knowing how way leads on to way, I doubted if I should ever come back. I shall be telling this with a sigh somewhere ages and ages hence, two roads diverged in a wood, and I, I took the one less traveled by, and that has made all the difference. Uh, this is the poet himself reading it. And this is Thomas. Uh, and as I said, they met, uh, very impressed with each other's work. And Thomas also starts, begins to write poetry himself. Uh, again, what they loved the most was nature. They also went, like Beethoven, for very long walks uh, together. And uh, Frost actually rented a cottage close to where Thomas lived, so they could be together more. Um, but, and this is the countryside at the time, 1913, Gloucestershire. And on one of these walks, something annoying happens. Uh, these, these two guys are, of course, gentlemen. And so they have the right to roam. They can go anywhere. There's nobody's going to stop them, right? And they're out 13 hours a day walking. One day, they are stopped. There's a gamekeeper, the guy with a gun, somebody, somebody who looks like this. And he stops them and he says, you can't, you can't pass here, you have to go back. Uh, and that's an awkward con conversation, of course, you know, a, a lower official like this, but a man with a gun, sending these two gentlemen on their road. So, uh, a, sort of an argument ensues, and, uh, and things get a little hot. Uh, and Frost is the American, the bold one, and says, listen, young, listen, my man, you can't talk to me like this. And Thomas says, never mind, you know, we'll, we'll leave him, we'll walk back, uh, it's not too far around. Uh, so, they, so they go back. And as they go back, Frost says, no, this, this can't stand. I'm, uh, this, this man can't talk to me like that. And they go back and they find him in his cottage. And there, the, the gamekeeper takes out his gun and points it at them. And things get quite hairy at that moment. So again, Thomas says, well, we've said our thing. Let's, let's, let's not get into this and let's go back. And as they go back, Frost is rather happy that he went back and gave a good account of himself. This, this, this man can't talk, talk to me like that. It's a good story, right? Nothing, nothing much happens. But then Frost, later on, publishes this poem. And uh, two roads diverge in yellow wood. And sorry I could not travel both and be one traveler. Long I stood and looked down as far as I could to where I bent in the undergrowth. This is nothing. You're in the, par you're in the forest. It's two paths. Are we left or right? And then he says, oh, crap, this is too fast. Uh, to where I bent in the undergrowth. And then he says, I took the other as just as fair, and having perhaps the better claim, because it was grassy and wanted wear, though as for that, the passing there had worn them really about the same. And both that morning equally lay in leaves, no step had trodden black, I kept the first for another day. Yet knowing how way leads on to way, I doubt it, if I could ever come back, I should ever come back. I shall be telling this with a sigh, somewhere ages and ages hence, two roads diverge in a wood, and I, I took the one less traveled by, and that has made all the difference. Now, 
I can see you, you love this. And this became rather an important poem in popular myth. Here's one uh, read by Alan Bates for an ad. Uh, it's not going to work. Could you start this piece, give us? I'll get you out of this sort of romantic approach for a bang. Two roads diverged in a yellow wood, and sorry I could not travel both and be one traveller. Long I stood and looked down one as far as I could to where it bent in the undergrowth, then took the other, as just as fair, and having perhaps the better claim because it was grass. All right, enough. Yes, uh, you know, this, you join this bank because they make the tough choices for you. Well, it's better explained in this clip from the film Dead Poet Society. Which, oh, again, Gedimas, can you start this, please? There we go. No great, just take, gentlemen, just take a stroll. I don't know if you've seen this. Uh, Robin Williams is a teacher at a strict school, and he's teaching his students to be rebellious, to trust their own instincts. There it is. thinking, is this right? It might be right, it might be right. I know that, maybe not, I don't know. Mr. Overstreet, driven by a deeper force. Yes. We know that, all right. And I didn't bring them up here to ridicule them. I brought them up here to illustrate the point of conformity, the difficulty in maintaining your own beliefs in the face of others. Now, those of you, I see the look in your eyes like, I would have walked differently. Well, ask yourselves why you are clapping. And we all have a great need for acceptance. You must trust that your beliefs are unique, your first. own, even though others may think them odd or unpopular, even though the herd may go, that's bad. <laughs> Robert Frost said, two roads diverged in the wood, and I, I took the one less traveled by, and that has made all the difference. I want you to find your own walk right now. Right, so you, you can see it's an attractive poem to, to read to students and say, interpret this poem as, the one road is harder than the other. You should try the hardest road. That's actually not what it says. I'll bring it back again. Two roads of rich and yellow wood. Sorry to have them. This is simple. But then it says, I took the other as just as fair. And having perhaps the better claim because it was grassy and wanted wear. Though, as for that, the passing there had worn them really about the same. And both that morning equally lay in leaves, no steps at trodden black. So what's the poem really? Poems, the poet's really saying, when you come to these crossroads, you have to make a choice, and you will never come back to that choice. You, ages and ages hence, you will think about it, but way leads on to way. You will never get back to that point. It's not about that the one was harder than the other. It's just that you hesitate for a moment, and then you take a path. That has made all the difference. That is not what Edward Thomas read. Edward Thomas saw the poem from his friend and immediately associated this with the incident with the gamekeeper where Frost had stood up to the gamekeeper and made a man of himself. And Thomas was the one who said, let's walk away, it'll be fine, he'll walk away. And was shocked by this, to see that his friend had interpreted this incident that way. Uh, and uh, Thomas enlisted at, uh, at the age of eight, 39, and became an officer in the artillery and died in Arras uh, immediately after arrival. So, thank you. A good cliché can get you killed. Thank you. It was fun and really educating. Educational. I think that all the literature teacher, uh, teachers were super thrilled about that. Uh, do we have any questions? You know, it's, it's, it's usually they're coming just later and or sending you an email or contacting on Facebook or catching you on the street. Okay, so thank you. What do you think about this conference? Do you have any insights? Or shall we just wrapping up and go into have a fantastic evening? No big insights. So, oh, Martin. 
just after 100 years of isolation in the Golden Cave, uh, it's a fantastic thing that first you did it, and second, it was such a pleasure to listen, and now I know what I missed the last half, one and a half year. Thanks for doing it. Yeah, so as today we heard a lot about relationship between design, between uh, different people. We heard about exhibitions, about museums. Uh, we talked about cliches. We talked about collecting things that looks like really usual, uh, like a sand. And uh, I'm really happy that it was not just a conference where designers talk for designers, but we had more wide, uh, dis let's say, discussions and topics. And this wouldn't happen without uh, the main organizer, Lithuanian Design Forum. That is also an organizer of Design Week Lithuania, which is already happening the whole week uh, in several cities at the same time. Uh, the event was sponsored by Vilnius Municipality. And special thanks for the partners, National Gallery of Art, uh, that is hosting us here today. Uh, Lithuanian Culture Institute uh, and their fantastic team who took care of our international guests and created really wonderful visit programs. Vilnius Academy of Arts uh, Design Foundation with Karolina Jakaite and uh, Hilton Garden in uh, Vilnius City Center that were really nicely keeping our guests and took care of their proper sleep and uh, wonderful breakfast. Uh, sip Sap, Birch Juice, Regulus, and uh, Seating from Emco. And the media partners are Lithuanian Radio and Television and Magazine Centras. So, I'm really thrilled. I hope that you had a good time and the day passed with a flash, as at least for me. So, hope to see you in other Design Week's events. And uh, for our international guests, so hopefully it's not the last time when you're here. So thank you very much, enjoy the evening and follow other Design Week's events. Thank you.